So uh, today we're going to be talking about continuous queries and retention policies, and uh, these are this is one of these are some of the uh, more exciting features I find in InfluxDB, especially um, because this is really where InfluxDB shines as a time series database. Um, so just a quick overview of what we'll be doing, we'll be talking about today. Um, basically, we'll be going through what a continuous query is and what they're used for. Um, then we're going to go and create our own continuous queries. Uh, next, we'll describe what a retention policy is um, and its relation to databases and series. Um, then we'll create our own retention policies. Um, and then finally, we'll combine retention policies and continuous queries in novel ways to manage, their, manage our data's life cycle. So, um, First, before we dive into the, all the continuous queries and everything, I just want to give a quick overview of the InfluxDB data model. Um, and this is important for understanding how to actually use continuous queries and retention policies. Um, so if you're not familiar, uh, InfluxDB is a time series database. Um, and time series uh, are always, uh, pretty much always taking in data indexed on time. Um, and so, as you see here, uh, we've just got a basic stock price graph, and uh, we're going to go through the components of all the pieces on this graph uh, just to show what actually is time series. Um, so, the first thing we have is the label on the top, the title. Um, this is what we call an InfluxDB a measurement, um, and measurements are usually something that's sort of like uh, something that you're actually taking a sample of or or, uh, or usually um, it's like a device or something like that. So if you think of like a CPU um, or uh, the amount of memory being used or uh, IO off a device, um, all of those are, would be what we call measurements in InfluxDB. Uh, next, we've got the metadata. So InfluxDB has a nifty feature called tags, um, and tags allow you to basically uh, index um, time series, index multiple time series. So if you say you're getting measurements from uh, a thousand different devices, or in this case, several different stocks, um, you can tag those in InfluxDB with different tags, and they'll be stored as separate time series, um, and it makes it very easy to uh, query and return data um, over basically individual time series, which is usually um, how we're interested in viewing this kind of data. Uh, and so the collection in InfluxDB, the collection of all the tags on the measurement is called a tag set. Um, and that includes uh, one thing to, to note about InfluxDB is that the tag set is the unique um, is all the uh, is the both the tag key and the tag value um, for all the tags. So um, the ticker equals a comma market equals Nasdaq. That is one tag set. Um, and if you were to say have ticker ticker a uh, comma market market equals NYSE, um, that would be a separate tag set. Um, so it's important to, to keep in mind that all tag sets themselves are the actual individual indexes in InfluxDB. Uh, moving on to the y-axis. Um, so the y-axis is usually uh, what we call an influx, it's what we call an InfluxDB a field. And the field is actually the, the individual price measurement in this case, or measurement of whatever uh, the value of the measurement um, that you're pulling. So it'd be you know, the, the uh, percentage of CPU usage or, um, uh, or in this case, the actual price of the stock. And uh, one thing to note um, that I forgot to mention earlier is tags are always strings. So the tag key and the tag value are always stored in InfluxDB as strings. Um, there's no other data type for, for tags. And actually in InfluxDB, Tags are actually considered almost their own data type. Um, so back to fields. Uh, fields can store uh, four different data types. 
they can store floats, ints, uh, strings, and booleans. Uh, so uh, one thing that's important to note when you're just setting up InfluxDB for new time is that uh, the field type cannot be changed um, once you write the first point in with that specific field key. Um, and in this case, field key here is price. Uh, and the um, you could have multiple field keys um, as a collection of fields, uh, or um, what we call a field set. So in this case, on this particular example, there's only one field, and that's price. But if we also wanted to have something like trading volume or um, I don't know, number of stories published or something like that as a counter. Uh, we could have that. Um, and uh, it's again, it's important to, to uh, know that the field, each field has its own type. Um, and once you write the first point in, um, that type is essentially set. And that also has implications for how we can query the data. Uh, so moving on, we obviously then have the timestamp, and this is the uh, key in InfluxDB. Um, everything in InfluxDB has a timestamp. Uh, it's a time series database. So uh, as you can see here, um, timestamps are stored um, in Unix nanoseconds, and we can query those in different ways. So uh, to bring this all together in InfluxDB, um, the way to specify all these things together and to actually get this data into InfluxDB, we use something called the line protocol. Um, and this is basically a combination of the measurement, uh, a comma, then the tag set, uh, with each tag separated by a comma as well. Um, and then the field set uh, after a space, and then the timestamp at the end. And the timestamp can be left off if you are, don't have a timestamp to supply with the, with the value, and InfluxDB will assign the timestamp when the, the point is adjusted. Um, so again, uh, when you send in data to InfluxDB, um, you're going to send in <coughs> multiple of these points. And uh, over time, once you send in enough points, you'll have a you know, bunch of values that you can graph using Grafana or another visualization tool like Chronograph. Um, <coughs> so again, series is the uh, measurement plus the tag set. Um, so in this case, we're showing actually three different series. Um, and uh, and so we've got the, the full time timestamp, sorry, the full series. Um, and then what's also important to note is that uh, there's also a concept of a single point in InfluxDB, and that single point is the measurement plus the unique timestamp plus the specific, sorry, the, the measurement plus the unique tag set plus a timestamp value um, equals a single point. So if you try, if you want to update a field, uh, you have to basically send in a new point with the same measurement, the same unique tag set as the point that you want to update and the same timestamp, and that will actually overwrite uh, the existing point uh, that's been in there. And that, um, and usually it's, or sorry, not usually, it's always the last point wins in that case. So uh, just as we go through the rest of the presentation, just remember that tags are the indexes, um, they're quick to query, um, and you, when you're pulling up a tag, um, you're pulling up uh, the actual time series. Um, fields are not indexed. Um, so if you're trying to do a threshold, say you want to get all the stock points that are above, that have a price above uh, $90, um, in that case, InfluxDB will have to go through each point, make the check on the price to make sure it's above $90, and then we'll return it. Whereas if you're pulling just in this instance, tag A, um, it, InfluxDB can go to disk and all those points are right there and can immediately return those, those values. 
And uh, it's also important to notice to know that all points are indexed by time. Um, so when you pull, uh, you know, if you want to pull all the points in the last hour, um, all the that searching for those last those points in the last hour is very quick as well. Um, and then finally, just a note is that unique series. So since the tags are the index, um, unique series can be um, a problem uh, because the tag the index is held in memory. Um, so if you have too many tags, uh, or sorry, if you have a lot of tags, you're will be using up a lot of memory, um, and it's almost a linear relationship. So uh, it's not something you should really worry about unless you're starting to get over 100,000 tags, um, individual tag sets, sorry, series. Um, but once you get over 100,000 series, um, you might want to start paying attention to tags because we've seen, um, we know of InfluxDB databases that can store millions of tags, um, but obviously the memory there, you're going to have to have a few gigs. Uh, so now let's move on to the actual meat of this presentation, which is designing a, a run tracking app. So uh, let's say we've got an app that we want to build, and this app is basically going to track our run. So I use Strava when I run. Um, I'm sure you guys all have mapped my run or some other uh, run tracking app when you go out for a run. Um, and we're going to... Um, basically sort of build a nifty little or model the nifty little app um, that tracks your heart rate and speed and distance. So um, basically uh, what we're going to track is, is everyone's going to have a user ID um, and each person who goes out for a run is going to be assigned a unique run ID and then we're also going to have the uh, distance that the runner's been running in the last second. Uh, we'll have the heart rate, which is the user's average heart rate over the last second, and then we'll have um, the speed, which is the calculated time to distance. Um, so in this app reports to InfluxDB every 10 seconds. So if we're saying this is an app on your phone, um, it's basically collecting um, on 10 seconds intervals and sending it to you in FlexDB. So keep this in mind as we go forward. Um, and then another note is that it, for this particular app, we only care about one minute resolution. So the user themselves, they don't really care about, you know, the 10 second variance um, from point to point um, because they probably only really care about a, a one minute resolution because um, that's likely all you'll be able to show on a mobile screen that actually makes sense. Um, so uh, the first thing we need to decide here is what is going to be a tag versus a field. Um, and uh, this is usually sort of the starting point um, when deciding uh, how you're going to structure your InfluxDB schema. And um, the the point I always like to make for this is that uh, when deciding between a tag and field, the uh, one of the important things to think about is how you're going to query it. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, when we're querying this data to show it uh, to our users, um, we're likely, if you think back to the stock chart that we showed earlier, um, the things that we're going to want to display to the user are actually going to be the distance um, the heart rate and the speed, um, and that's going to be what's actually graphed on the graph. So um, the distance, the heart rate, and speed are all going to be um, what we want to have as uh, fields. So if we actually took these as ta as uh, tags, uh, they would have a huge number of different um, amounts of values. Um, so and the other thing to note is that we all, you actually don't actually get much benefit from setting these as tags because very often are you going to be um, looking for, you know, all points that have a heart rate above, um, 
you know, a heart rate at like 100 beats per minute or something like that. So, um, so when we think about what we want to query, um, it's usually best to just start with a list of questions. Um, in this case, uh, we're going to ask, uh, so what was the user's average speed during the run? Um, how far did the user run? Uh, what was the user's average heart rate during a run? What was the user's maximum heart rate during the run? Um, all these are valid questions that we actually wanted, we'll find use in our app. Um, so again, we're thinking about this, these questions and we're going to think, use these questions to inform how we're going to organize our database. So, Um, option one, uh, so I'm going to lay out a few of the options um, that we have for, for laying out this data. Um, in option one, we're going to have measurements and we're going to have uh, a user, uh, we're going to have a bunch of measurements, measurement names with the user and then the run laid out. Um, and this is what you would see in, for instance, like a graphite database. Um, graphite obviously refers to uh, dot separated uh, lists of measurements of series. Um, and we just have, in that case, we wouldn't have any tags. And then we'd have the fields, uh, distance, speed, and heart rate. Option two would be to have everything in a run stats measurement um, and then have everything as fields. Um, and in this case, uh, this is not a bad option. Um, it stores everything as fields, so it's very quick to pull up. Um, however, um, if we're storing user ID and run ID as fields, it makes it very hard to pull the data out because remember, fields are not indexed. So if we say we want all of the points, um, sorry, all the points for user one, um, we have to go in there into all the series and scan through everything and pull out just the points that have um, the user ID one. And option three is to have a single measurement, two tags, and um, the rest are fields. And obviously, this is the correct way to structure this particular example app, um, where you're going to have a run stats measurement, um, which is the sort of encompassing measurement of the device. Uh, and you're going to have tags, user ID, and run ID, which are indexed. So it's very easy to pull up. Um, you know, we're going to have user ID one and we want to pull up run 32. Uh, that's very easy and quick in FlexDB because it literally just goes to disk, pulls that information, and it's all ready to send back to you. Uh, and the fields are going to be distance, speed, and heart rate. Um, so when it goes to disk and pulls that, it's going to be sending that those series of distance, speed, and heart rate directly. And usually, um, again, we don't care about the the individual values of the speed and the distance and the heart rate. Um, we only care about sort of the aggregates when displaying those to the user. Um, so that's what's actually going to be graphed in this case. So um, quick exercise. Uh, given that a run ID is unique, does the inclusion of user ID as a tag increase the series cardinality? In this case, no, it doesn't actually increase the series. Um, the run ID is, um, sorry. Since the, uh, since each run ID has a unique user, having a tag user ID does not increase the number of unique series. Um, that's because if you think about uh, the way that you're reporting, um, every run ID is only going to be associated with one specific user. Um, so if you think about this, uh, you know, one person, one account uh, is going to be going on multiple runs. And uh, each of those runs is, since it's a unique run ID, and each run only has, has one ID, uh, that run is going to only have one user ID. Uh, because uh, unless we're doing some super fancy thing, maybe like a group running app, uh, that run ID will always have only one user ID and will always report it as such. 
And so when you're talking about cardinality, in this case, the run ID is the only contributor to the overall cardinality because um, the way it's stored on, our di on disk is that um, basically each run ID is a separate series. And then the, the user ID is a separate, is basically the same index in the series. You can ask questions about that in the, in the Q and A if you um, have trouble understanding that. Uh, so overall, our schema is going to look like this with the run stats, tags as user ID and run ID, and then the fields distance, speed, and heart rate. Um, and to bring this all together, our our line protocol will look something like the examples here. Um, so uh, the comma separated. Uh, measurement and tag set. In this case, the tag set is the user ID um, and then the run ID and then the space and then the set of fields. Um, so the distance, the speed, and the heart rate, and then the uh, timestamp at the end. Uh, one important thing to note here is the heart rate. If you see it's equal to once the first example, the heart rate is equal to 170i. The 170i, the i signifies integer. Um, so for the, for the heart rate field, we're storing uh, an integer, uh, an integer, the field as an integer. And the other ones, uh, since they don't have an I, InfluxDB will always assume uh, that if you have a, a number, even without a decimal point uh, with no I, um, that that field, that that number is a float in line protocol. So again, going back to our questions that we're trying to answer, uh, what was the user's average speed for a run? How far did the user run? What was the user's average heart rate during a run? And what was the user's maximum heart rate during the run? So again, we receive this data fairly frequently um, at 10 second granularity. And when we're displaying this to the, to the user, we only really care about one minute granularity. So let's quickly go over creating this database. Um, and the create database is, is just create database equals runner, or create database runner. And so to answer our first question, in the last hour, what was the average speed for the run um, with a specific ID? In this case, run, run ID equals three for each minute. And <clears throat> to answer that, we're going to use uh, just a query, and this query is a simple select query where we're selecting the aggregate mean of the speed field um, from the run stats measurement where the time is um, within the last hour and our run ID, um, in this case, the tag run ID is equal to three, um, and we're grouping um, as we aggregate the re results back, we're going to group it by a minute. In this case, we've got written here 60 seconds, but it's a minute. Um, you can also use 1M. Uh, and, and if you see in the, right after there's the select, the mean, select mean speed, um, that means that we're aggregating this data in by the minute as a mean. Um, so we're finding the mean speed per minute for the last hour just for run ID three. And this is just a, a simple query. Um, so uh, next we're going to do what is the, in the last hour, what is the total distance per run? Uh, very similar, except this time we're gonna aggregate by the sum um, of the distance. And this is the distance per minute or the last hour for run ID three. Uh, and then the next question, uh, about the average heart rate per minute. Um, again, very similar, we're finding the mean just on the heart rate field. And finally, uh, what would be the query to find the last hour? Uh, in this case, uh, we're finding the heart rate. And uh, because it's the heart rate, uh, we care really about um, the mean isn't, the mean is useful, but really when we're running, we want to actually know sort of the max 
uh, heart rate that you're getting up to, right? Because a lot of peri a lot of people already sort of care about uh, you know the uh, the effort that they're exerting at the maximum. And so in this case, we'd actually find this returns the maximum heart rate measurement reading per that interval. So the maximum measurement, the maximum heart rate per minute over the last hour for run ID three. So uh, putting this all together, um, we can combine all four of these queries into one single query um, to return this data uh, to you know graph on the user's phone. And uh, basically, you just combine all of the previous, uh, the previous selects um, where you're selecting on the fields into one, one select. So we're selecting the mean, um, and then we can use the as keyword to assign an alias uh, for the resulting series. Um, so in the JSON response, you'll get um, speed, distance, heart rate, and max hour instead of a uh, if you don't specify the alias, you'll get uh, just the the name of the field return will be mean. And as you can see, the from run stats where time is greater than now and run ID equals three, group by time 60 seconds, that's all the same as the other queries. So that's an easy way to combine four queries that we would have previously been issuing separately into one query. Um, and uh, since we're going to probably be graphing all of these, you know, either on the same graph or multiple graphs on the same screen, uh, it makes sense to sort of combine this into one query um, so that we can get all the data at once um, and put less stress on influx um, with fewer queries. Uh, so one thing to note about this is that this is a specific run ID. Um, and in this case, uh, <laughs> um, maybe not for the end user application, but if we're doing processing, maybe we want uh, this data for all the run IDs. Or in this case, um, if we're displaying on the app all of the user's previous runs, the stats for each run, um, how will we show that? <coughs> so uh, in that case, we're going to also, um, it's easily, we can easily do this by grouping by an actual tag um, in this case, if you see down at the bottom, there's group by 60 seconds, um, comma run ID, comma user ID. Uh, what that it basically says is that <coughs> go out and um, find all of the uh, all of the uh, tags um, with unique with unique values in run ID and return all those series, and then also group them by user ID in the response. So, um, so another, some other questions is, what do we do to think about is, what do we do with the results of the query? And also, uh, when do we run the query to downsample all of our data? Um, and this is important um, because basically, if you think about, we're sending these queries and if we were to add this to our app, each query, if we go up back here, <coughs> each query is, basically telling InfluxDB to calculate this on the fly. So we're going under, and um, every time we issue this query, InfluxDB is going to the raw data at the 10 second intervals and grouping it um, by minute. So every, so um, 60 measure, sorry, 60 points per minute, taking uh, the speed, taking each field, so the speed, the distance, the heart rate for each of those groups, and then combining them as the mean, the sum, the mean, the max. Um, and it's doing that and calculating all those values on the fly every time you make this query. Um, and that's a lot of wasted CPU. So um, in, this, in this particular example, right, it's a little trivial, um, but if you're starting to get to uh, more intense analytics and faster speeds and more data, um, this starts to become important. Um, and that's where continuous queries come in. Um, so continuous queries allow you to uh, basically issue <coughs> a, set up a query that will run periodically and it will 
uh, run on a subset of data uh, and take the result that returns from that query and insert it back into InfluxDB um, into a measurement uh, or database of your choice. So if you think about um, these queries as basically they're, they're queries on, on cron jobs um, and uh, they're built directly into InfluxDB. Uh, so basically, um, once you set these continuous queries up, they just run on a specific interval uh, forever. And then any data um, that that query returns, um, it will write back into InfluxDB. And this allows you to basically pre-calculate the mean, the max, uh, the sum of, of these series uh, before you actually query them. Um, so you can get, so you can, instead of querying for the 10 second data, you can query off of the rolled up data or what we call down sampled data um, that has already been calculated for a larger segment of time. So uh, the basic format of a continuous query um, is uh, just some basic boilerplate. Uh, in this case, it's a create continuous query. We assign the, we can assign the continuous query a name, um, and then we also can assign it <coughs> a database to live on. Um, and optionally, we can also set the resample um, every interval and for interval. And I'll talk about those in a second. Um, and then next you get the, you have a begin keyword. Um, and then after the beginning, it's pretty much uh, a regular query um, that you would find in any query that you send to the database regularly, um, uh, followed by an end statement. And in that query, the only thing for continuous que that query and the continuous query that's different from what a regular query would be would be the into statement. Uh, and that's basically just the the location of the um, of where you want the continuous query to write the data that it pulls back into. Uh, so uh, just to also go over the resample that I glossed over, um, the re there's two sort of options for each continuous query that you can set on the query it's on the continuous query itself, and that is the resample every interval, uh, which is uh, basically how often the continuous query will run. And as, I, as I'll explain later, <coughs> and continuous query uh, groups by an aggregate, uh, but the resample every is actually when it will, InfluxDB will sort of uh, wake up and, and, and actually issue those queries, issue these, generate the query to issue to pull the data and write back in. Um, and then the for clause is uh, the is how far back InfluxDB will pull for each each individual continuous query. So in this case, um, if we're trying to you know basically say we can ex say we have a an app and we're expecting points that could come in as late as one hour after the current time, we can say set the four to the four interval to one hour and InfluxDB will issue continuous queries that go all the way back one hour, at least one hour whenever those, issue, those queries are issued um, and recalculate all of the uh, points up and, up and from that one hour previous to present. <coughs> so uh, just a quick example using resample. Um, in this case, we're going to just have a sort of dummy, um, say we have a dummy data set uh, and we're just measuring uh, CPU usage. Um, in this case, we're going to resample every 10 minutes for 30 minutes. Um, and in this case, we're finding the mean over the mean for in time, sorry. We're finding the mean of the busy measurement, sorry, the busy field um, in the CPU measurement um, grouped by five minutes <coughs> and all the tags that exist on that measurement. Um, just to note the, if you see the group by time, uh, five minutes, comma, star, the star indicates that uh, you want to group by all the existing tags. Um, and that's important to keep in mind if you want to preserve all the existing tags 
on a measurement when you're running this continuous query. Um, so to go back to the resample every 10 minutes for 30 minutes, what this is saying is that uh, this continuous query is going to run every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, InfluxDB, the continuous query service in, in InfluxDB will wake up. It'll look at this continuous query and say, oh, this continuous query needs to run. Um, I'm going to generate the new query for this continuous query. And that query will be basically a select mean busy as busy um, from CPU uh, group by time five minutes comma star. And the important thing is that um, when the continuous query engine underneath actually generates this query, it'll also add a where clause um, that limits the the actual uh, time period that this query runs over to um, to the latest 30 minutes. Um, and this is the four 30 minutes. Um, so, uh, so basically, it'll run this, this continuous query um, for five minute intervals over the last 10 minutes. And you can ask in the Q&A if that was a bad explanation, which I think it was. Um, and Jack will be able to answer that for you. All right, so uh, let's go over an exercise applying this, applying continuous, th applying the, the previous query that we wrote and making that into a continuous query. Um, so if you, if you remember from last time, from earlier, uh, we've got the mean of the speed, the sum of the distance, the mean of the heart rate, the max of the heart rate, and we're grouping that all by uh, into one minute intervals for the last hour. Um, and we're also grouping by the run ID and the user ID. So converting this into a continuous query um, means that we're going to add the basic boilerplate at the front, which is the create continuous query. Um, and we're just going to name it uh, reduce uh, reso. And uh, we're going to have that on the uh, runner database, and we're gonna ha then we have the begin um, sort of boilerplate, and then we have our our actual query itself. And the important thing to note here is that the the where clause is no longer in this query, um, because if you look previously, we had where time is greater than now minus one hour. In this case, in the continuous queries, this doesn't matter because continuous queries will always um, Regenerate the where clause when they are run, um, and in this case, uh, it the where clause that the continuous query generates defaults to the group by time um, period. So uh, the group by time interval in this case, sixty seconds. So essentially, what this is this continuous query is um, is doing create continuous query on uh, runner begin resample every uh, 60 seconds for 60 seconds, basically. And uh, just a quick note that you can show the continuous queries uh, by doing a show continuous queries command. And it will list out uh, basically the name of the continuous query with the database it's on and, uh, and the actual query itself. <coughs> um, and so that what this will do is basically start running a continuous query um, that goes through, calculates all these, the mean, um, the sum of the distance, the mean of the heart rate, and insert that back into a new measurement called the reduced run stats measurement. And so that measurement now will only contain the uh, one minute data uh, for run stats already aggregated. Um, so when we pull that data, instead of writing a, uh, a query that aggregates this data with a group by clause, we'll actually just be pulling this data um, with no group by clause because the data is already sort of grouped by the, the data in the reduced run rate stats is already grouped by a minute and pre-calculated essentially. So now that we've dialed and sampled our data, um, <clears throat> what can we do with our old data? Uh, in this case, um, <coughs> old data, uh, 
in this case, the amount of data we're probably generating is, is, is small on this app, but if we think about you know, maybe if our app blows up and we have got a million, a million users and, you know, several million runners, um, and we've got a big box to put this on with a lot of memory, um, and we're ingesting, um, you know, tons of points per second from each of these runs, uh, we're going to end up storing a lot of data um, in the original measurement with a 10 second interval. Uh, and, um, since we only care about the one minute data, um, we don't really need the data in the one second interval after we've downsampled the data using the continuous query into the one minute rollup. Um, and so what retention policies are is basically a feature built specifically to figure out how to expire data once you no longer need it. Um, because there's no point in having a bunch of 10 second interval data uh, if you only care about the one minute interval data um, after that's calculated. Uh, so <coughs> a retention policy can describe how long you want to store that data for. Um, in this case, we call that the duration. Um, it can also describe, it also describes, um, in this case, if you have a cluster, uh, which if you want a cluster, you can sign up on our influx data, I'm sorry, our influx cloud for uh, a new cluster. Um, <coughs> it in, a, in a cluster sense, it describes the replication of the data. And then uh, it, uh, each retention policy belongs to a database. You can assign uh, the retention policy. Um, basically, when you write the data in, um, you can write it to a specific retention policy. Um, so you can know that any data you write to that retention policy is only going to stick around for it the amount of time that you set. So uh, how to create a retention policy. Um, this is very similar <coughs> uh, to the other influx QL statements. We've got to create retention policy, the name of the policy itself. Uh, we're going to specify the, na the name of the database that you want to create that retention policy on. And then um, we'll set the duration, which again is the time that you want to keep the data for. Uh, we'll set the replication, which again is only useful if you have got a cluster, um, and that will determine how many basically replicas of the data that you're storing on the cluster. Um, and then uh, the other thing you want to mention, you want to add, you can add is the uh, shard duration, which is uh, it's a little bit more nuanced um, if you're looking at setting the shard duration. But basically, shard duration is. Um, is how much data InfluxDB uh, will store uh, the data on disk, the number of files that InfluxDB will use to store the data on disk. Um, and that's an actual time duration. So <coughs> if you're, um, uh, this, the shard duration will be calculated automatically um, when you set up a retention policy based on the duration. If you don't, if you don't set a shard duration, but if you want to set a shard duration, you can set that yourself. And usually we find that a longer shard duration is uh, better in terms of storage density. Uh, it leads to fewer files on disk because it'll basically store that data, more data in one file. Um, and so shard duration is, is purely optional. Um, but if you do have some specific requirements, um, I do recommend up looking up in the docs what shard duration can do for you. Um, there's also finally the default. Uh, so each, each database has a what's called a default retention policy. <coughs> and the, uh, the default retention policy is basically the retention policy that will be used if you send a point to InfluxDB and you only specify the database but no retention policy. Um, so the default retention policy uh, when you're sending points into FXDB, it's usually useful to never specify the actual re retention policy um, unless you have a need to and let InfluxDB assign in the data that's coming in to just the default retention policy. And then that makes it really easy um, if you say you realize you're collecting too much data and you want to change your retention policy to something with a shorter duration. Um, say you're collecting um, a whole bunch of data and you've got uh, a duration of one week and 
Um, that's the default uh, retention policy. And you want to uh, switch that because you're storing too much data. You don't have enough, da enough disk to store all that data. Um, you want to switch it to a new retention policy with a duration of one day. Um, in that case, you would simply issue a create retention policy statement um, and set that new retention policy with a duration of one day as the default. And then any points coming in that aren't specifying a specific retention policy will automatically get routed to that new retention policy. So <coughs> let's go over a quick exercise on how to um, reason about creating your own retention policy. Um, in this case, we want to set up a retention policy um, with a replication of one um, uh, with a default retention policy and set that as the default retention policy. And in this case, uh, we've got uh, a create retention policy one hour on the database runner, and we'll set their duration to one hour. Um, in this case, you can uh, just set replication of one and then set the uh, set this retention policy as the default. And then you can show that with show retention policies on the database runner. Um, and so now basically what this will do is that any points coming in for our runner database uh, that don't have a specific retention policy set will be sent to the one hour retention policy with a duration one hour. Um, so what that means is basically uh, uh, the data after one hour will be auto automatically removed from the disk. So anything older than one hour uh, will be removed. And there's some more information on the docs about how that data is actually removed um, and how that data is removed and like and, and uh, some of the nuance around there is also related to the, the shard duration I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's all the docs if you want to read up on what that means. Um, <clears throat> so if you think about our database now, uh, you can think about the InfluxDB instance as sort of the top level with a whole bunch of databases. Um, and each of those databases have a retention policy. Um, and you can think of those retention policies as buckets that contain um, a series. And again, as mentioned earlier, a series is the unique measurement plus the unique tag set. Um, and this is this is basically how it's how it, at a high level, um, InfluxDB stores this data on disk um, with each each series as a uh, list of timestamps and values, field values. Um, <coughs> so if we think about a fully qualified measurement. And this is what you would put in the from clause in a query. Uh, measurements are fully qualified both by their database, their retention policy, and their measurement. Um, in this case, uh, in this case, uh, you don't always have to when you're issuing a query. You don't always have to list out the database, the retention policy, and the measurement. Um, but if you do, you can always can on a query. Um, if you don't, let, uh, if you don't include the database, the query will use the request parameter um, DB. Uh, if you don't specify a retention policy, uh, InfluxDB will use the default retention policy that you set um, for that database. And a measurement when you're issuing a query is always required. So <coughs> uh, what we're going to want to do now is get our previously created continuous query um, and uh, basically alter it so that we're going to have that continuous query take from our um, our run stats measurement with the 10 second interval data and downsample it into uh, a new reduced run stats retention policy um, which presumably will have a longer retention policy on. So um, what we're doing here is uh, basically we'll change the from clause to explicitly state the database that we want to pull the data from, the retention policy that we want to pull the data from. In this case, it's going to be the one hour retention policy, um, which is the one we made earlier that has a smaller, 
uh, a smaller retention duration. Um, and the data in this in this uh, retention policy is only kept for one hour. Um, and we're going to pull it from the measurement run stats in the one hour uh, retention policy. And then in the into clause, you can see we're going to take the results of this continuous query and write them back into the runner database and do a different and do a different retention policy called default. Um, in this case, we're going to assume default is a retention policy with uh, no um, with an infinite duration, um, which basically you can specify as INF, and that's, that's in the docs as well. Um, and we're going to name the new measurement reduced run stats. Uh, <coughs> so basically, if you think about going back to our little tree here, if you think about the way we want to move data around in our database um, when we're downsampling data, is we're going to have the sort of raw series um, in a shorter uh, duration retention policy, and we're going to be taking the continuous queries that are going to read from those shorter duration retention policies and downsample that data, aggregate it, and then take that data and put it into a new uh, a new series, uh, which it, with presumably a longer retention policy or an infinite retention policy. In that way, we can take sort of raw samples that uh, you know are maybe too uh, too specific and uh, and downsample it into either the format that we're the uh, uh, sort of aggregate uh, amount that we're going to use for our queries or for you know archive storage so that uh, you know if you want to go back a year you can see um, the specific run rate for that user so that's uh, the end of the presentation